All right, interview of Mr. Richard Benson Rogers, 13 March 2001, the Binghamton Armory. The interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hasselm, and videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Rogers, tell me where you were, where and when were you born? I was born March 23rd, 1922, in Bay City, Michigan. Did you grow up there? Yes, I did. I attended schools, attended a junior college, and uh, I went on to uh, University of Michigan for one year and then went into the service. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you come to be in the service? Well, my father had been an instructor in ground school for the Savaya Civilian Pilot Training Program. So I uh, signed up and I uh, actually got a uh, pilot's license. And at that point I decided I uh, wanted to go into the uh, Air Force and enlisted at Selfridge Field in uh, 1943 and then went on into uh, the Air Forces. Tell me a little bit about the civilian pilot training program. What was that like? Well, this was the, uh, uh, a program that was initiated uh, back in the uh, late 30s and early 40s. The idea was to uh, prepare uh, civilians for potential uh, work, or, uh, work in the uh, Air Force. It's a, and enlistment in the Air Forces. And uh, we had ground school, and uh, uh, we flew uh, small Piper Cubs. And out of that, you got a pilot's license. Mm -hmm. With the anticipation, you'd, you'd be going into the Air Force. Okay. And uh, were you, did you solo in the Piper Cub? Or was it yes, I, uh, I had the uh, usual lessons and soloed. In fact, uh, I had one incident on my solo. I, uh, the uh, Piper Cub, uh, being a very small airplane, you could look out the uh, side of the windows and see the ground coming up. And as I came in and landed for my so first solo landing, I glanced down and the ground was rushing up. And I can still hear that instructor screaming at me, almost ruined his plane because I went into a stall, but I got out of it all right. And uh, now tell me about how you enlisted in the Air Force. Well, I went down to Selfridge Field in, uh, in Michigan, and, uh, and then from there down to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi boot camp. And at that point, uh, I'd anticipated in good, uh, going into pilot's training. Mm -hmm. But uh, from boot camp, we uh, went on to Penn State for uh, about six months and then went into uh, the other training program. But at that point, we were at Penn State, the order came through that all uh, of the class was to be converted uh, over to uh, bombardiers and navigators. There was a shortage at that point. So at that time, I became a, went into uh, bombardier training. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, from there, uh, I went into the uh, B-29 program, and the B-29 was supposed to be the wondrous uh, you know, plane of the uh, period, and uh, I had training on the uh, B-17s, B-24, and then eventually into the B-29s. Tell me about bombardier training. What was that like? Well, it was uh, fascinating. We uh, were down in uh, uh, the south. Uh, West for the most of the time, we uh, uh, pinpointed on those cities that were uh, most uh, like the uh, cities in the Far East, and uh, we uh, flew uh, a lot at night, played golf in the daytime, and uh, it was quite an experience. We flew what's, all over the south. What coast. cities were most like the ones in the Far East? Gosh, I can't tell you right. I think uh, uh, I can't tell you right. I can't remember that, but I remember it was in the rural areas. And they would pick out uh, various cities, and uh, we'd do our pinpoint uh, bombing on them. Now, at this time, were you flying in B-29s, or were you still training in 17s? We went from B-17s into 29s, mm -hmm. and uh, after that uh, training, uh, we uh, uh, went out to Kansas. We were assigned to a B-29 crew. And then we stayed, I stayed with that crew, Carl Leedy's crew, for the entire uh, three years of uh, our war experience. How was it transitioning from the 17 to the 29? It wasn't difficult because we had uh, we spent a number of hours on uh, uh, in the 17th to 24th, but we had the Sperry bomb site initially, 
and then we were converted over to the Norden bomb site, which was the most sophisticated bomb site at the time. Was there much difference between the Sparing and the Norden? Not really. Well, once you got into one, it was the mechanics were, uh, were somewhat different. And uh, in the B-29, you were located in the plexiglass nose, and you had the, you were, uh, the uh, chief gunnery officer as well as the bombardier. So you had a gun site and your bomb site. You had primary control over the uh, front turrets, the upper and lower, secondary control over the rear turrets, and, uh, and then the, uh, uh, with your uh, uh, bomb site. Was the B-29 still having a lot of teething problems when oh, we first yeah. started? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think we ever came back from a mission with all four engines running. And uh, when we were over in the Far East, uh, we'd, we'd gone over to India uh, and we were stationed there and did uh, some of the bombings uh, of, uh, in Burma and down in Singapore, Singapore dry docks. And then uh, from there we uh, went over to uh, uh, the Mariana Islands. Right, and all that time you had problems with the... Uh, yeah, uh, it was continually a... a, a a problem. We had to land at Iwo Jima uh, several times, not only because of flak, but because of engine uh, problems. Well, let's go back to Kansas and take it forward from there. Mm -hmm. you, you were shaped up with your crew? Yes, I uh, formed a crew there. Carlini was the uh, uh, captain, and uh, we trained out of there for uh, uh, several months, and uh, then uh, at I think we lost only one member during the entire period we were, uh, we were uh, together. Uh, it was a, uh, a gunner that uh, had become ill and he had to be replaced after about the first couple of weeks. But from that point on, we remained as a unit. Okay. And how long were you training together before you went overseas? Well, I think it was about, uh, uh, about six months. And uh, we had uh, uh, <clears throat> let's see here. in August 1944 the crew was formed, and uh, on August the 18th, uh, 44, we had our first flight as a crew, and then we left in November for Kearney, Nebraska, and uh, we did some uh, practice flying out of there. And uh, in the middle of November, we left uh, Kearney for uh, the Far East. We landed in Puerto Rico, British Guiana, Brazil, El Crawl, and then finally to our, our base in uh, Karachi, India. And uh, we landed there in uh, the middle of December uh, 1944. So what was it like being in India in those days? It was interesting in that uh, uh, on the uh, the field itself, uh, oftentimes you'd have uh, uh, cows, and cows were considered uh, uh, sacred, of course, by the Indians at that point. They were wandering around. You had uh, uh, natives uh, working in the uh, uh, barracks, and the barracks were all thatched roof. In fact, I remember uh, entering one, I heard some gunshots, and one of the gunners was lying on bed shooting at rats running across the top of the uh, 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 ceiling, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, we were about a hundred miles out of uh, Calcutta, and on weekends we'd go into Calcutta, and it was uh, an eye-opening experience uh, as uh, uh, youngsters from small towns so forth. We'd never seen anything like it, and the uh, I remember there were beggars in the uh, street, there were beggars on the sidewalk, and beggars next to the uh, s storefronts. And uh, at one point, uh, uh, we went into one store there that it was draped in black, and the owner had uh, died. As we came out, we saw uh, this uh, body being carried down to the burning gas, covered in black, and it, it was the owner. And they had taken him down, and uh, uh, cremation took place on the Ganges. Mm -hmm. It's quite an experience there. And uh, at one point, the Red Cross introduced me to a uh, one of the 
uh, leaders of uh, India, and he had actually offered me uh, to pay my way back, and I'd come back and do a history of uh, Calcutta, India at that point. So we had all kinds of uh, interesting experiences in that. Uh, remember, we stayed at the Grand Hotel, and we had our dinner, and we went out on the street, and all at once we heard somebody coming from behind yelling, uh, bakshi, bakshi, and we'd forgotten to leave a tip, and there was a waiter <laughs> running down the street for a tip. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I did. Did, you, did you mix it up very much with uh, other Allied troops, I mean the British? Or? No, we're at, uh, being in the Air Force, you tended to be quite separate, and uh, separate from the combat below, and also from uh, other troops. So that uh, we were uh, so rather self-contained, and uh, we would uh, 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 do our flying uh, out of the base, that was about it. So we tended to be somewhat isolated. What, what were conditions like at the base? Well, <clears throat> we lived in thatched uh, roof uh, uh, huts, and uh, rather primitive. The, uh, of course, we spent an awful lot of time out on the flight line, uh, working on the planes. So it was a rather quiet uh, uh, life, and uh, at that point the uh, monsoons hadn't hit, so it was rather uh, warm when we hot when we were there. Were you there when the monsoons came? No. By that time, we had uh, departed from the Marianne Islands. The 20th Air Force, at the end of 1944, had moved to the Marianne Islands out of the CBI. And so, we were, in fact, were the last plane out of uh, India. And uh, we landed in China and then took off from there uh, to uh, the Marianne Islands. Well, tell me about the uh, combat missions you went on from India. Uh, <clears throat> we went on several. Uh, we had uh, we understood uh, there were orders not to touch Singapore that, uh, by the British, and so our uh, missions down there were on the uh, Singapore dry docks, and, uh, and we only uh, did two or three. Uh, uh, at that time, we were a replacement crew. We did an awful lot of practice bombing throughout India and so forth. So we spent an awful lot of time on practice missions, but the, uh, the actual missions themselves are down around the uh, in Burma and uh, the dry docks. Did you run into a lot of opposition from the Japanese Air Force? Uh, some. We had a. Uh, I recall one incident that. Uh, uh, as you went down and you got nearer the target, you'd look up and see what you called the chow line with the Japanese fighters. And uh, remember one incident that uh, uh, as you went in on the, uh, uh, the bombing run, the, uh, the bombardier took over control of the plane, over into the bomb site. And uh, we dropped our bombs and they yelled bombs away and as I got out of my uh, a seat to uh, get rid of my flak suit, out of the clouds came a Japanese fighter. And he had guns blazing. I still see those guns blazing, so I shot him down. And I often wondered who he was. You know, he was doing his duty as I was doing mine. And uh, we had just several such incidents as that, a lot of flak. And then uh, and one mission, we actually had to land uh, uh, in Burma on the way back with the flak. Where in Burma? Pardon? You remember where in Burma? Yeah, no, where? I don't. I really don't remember this. Now, your first experience in combat, that must have been quite a nerve-wracking experience. Well, it was <coughs> it's interesting <coughs> that uh, you tended to be somewhat isolated from the impact of what you were doing. and. Uh, it really hit you, uh, I guess, when you saw those fighters coming on you, know, and you, uh, uh, and the flak that you uh, experienced. I remember one time we got back to the base, and I got out and I yelled at Harry, the radio operator, "Hey, Harry, come on over here!" And there was a big hole in the side of the plane, uh, up in at, uh, at least a foot in diameter, and. Uh, he had just missed Harry. Uh, he was between the uh, bulkhead was between himself and the hole, 
Mary almost fainted. But I think Carl Levy still has that piece of flat. Oh, yeah, those experiences. Yeah, what was it like when you landed in the Marianas? Uh, <clears throat> we were a, a replacement uh, crew, as I indicated, and uh, all the uh, 29s were being moved over. So it's a huge number of uh, planes, and when you, uh, you land, you just became a part of uh, hundreds of planes. And you follow the uh, routine. We weren't in the uh, South Pacific, so the climate was uh, very nice and a uh, very comfortable climate. Must have been uh, very different from uh, Karachi. A lot more planes? A lot more planes, yeah. And it wasn't as primitive as over in Karachi. In other Karachi, you had the Indian influence, primitive conditions over surrounding the, uh, the base. In uh, Grand Island, the uh, uh, CBs had come in and, and cleaned out uh, space for airfields and so forth. And that was a huge operation. You got a feeling. Were, were you on Saipan or Tinian? Tinian. And that was practically the entire island was like one giant airfield. Yes, right. And in fact, there are two fellows who are uh, who have produced a uh, a tape uh, of uh, the history of Tinian from the time it was a civilization that first was known there to, through the war and so forth. And uh, it's a complete history of uh, American and Japanese occupation and so forth. When you weren't flying, what did you do on Tinian? Uh, you mean our, our missions? Yeah, when you weren't flying. Oh, when we weren't flying. How did flying. you spend your time on Tinian? Uh, it was rather boring. We, uh, we <laughs> had... Uh, <coughs> we made uh, our own uh, golf courses. We played the uh, bridge, and uh, you get into some very serious games. I remember one time uh, I made some mistakes, and I thought my bridge partner was going to pull his gun out and shoot me. <laughs> the bridge was taken very seriously by some of them, so you tried to avoid uh, those kinds of games. Did you ever? Uh, Get a chance to get out and meet any of the, the natives, the Chamorros? No, not really. The, uh, uh, in on Iwo Jima, our uh, uh, co-pilot and navigator had uh, wandered away from the base, went to a cave, and uh, they saw at the end of the cave some clothes, and they pulled the clothes back, and there was a skeleton. And so we had some of those experiences rather than. Well, tell me about a typical combat mission. How would, how would your day start? How would the mission proceed? Well, it, there was an awful lot of preparation, of course, that went into it. And uh, uh, briefings. And, uh, as you uh, uh, say, if it's a night mission, you would have your, uh, your dinner and then your various kinds of briefings. And then when you got to the plane, uh, the uh, captain checked everyone out. And uh, you had to check uh, everything you were responsible for. And it was a uh, fairly intensive routine of checking on the, uh, see that the bombs were uh, in place, no uh, mistakes had been made, and uh, uh, checking all the controls. And you went through uh, that whole uh, flight procedure. And then uh, once the takeoff, people had assigned duties during the course of the uh, uh, flight. And as gunnery officer, I had the responsibility not only for the operation of the uh, bomb site, but also the guns. They were remotely controlled? All remote controlled, yeah. All from your station? Well, uh, <coughs> we had uh, uh, four gunners. I was up in front, and with a remote uh, uh, control uh, unit, and I had primary control of the guns up in front. Uh, upper and lower, and the secondary control of the guns in back. And then each gunner had a control in the back of his uh, respective uh, turret. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, coordination had to take place between myself and the, uh, and the gunners. Well, how did you do that? Well, <coughs> we had areas of responsibility, and also that as you were uh, uh, flying, uh, to your target, you had. Uh, I had to check out a variety of long 
checklist that we had to follow. And the gunners had to do the same thing. And so by following the uh, routine and uh, keeping close to the checklist and so forth, that when we arrived on the target, we were set to drop the bombs and, and leave. And then what would you? What would happen when you get back to the base? Well, <clears throat> we were pretty well drained out by that time, and it was a 3,000 mile. And uh, several times, as I indicated, that we had to, st uh, had to stop over at Iwo Jima, and then we got back. And then you fell into the usual routine, because you had to go back and again, uh, uh, again work on the flight line and uh, checking out the equipment, sure it's operating, and so forth. Why did you have to land at Iwo Jima? Pardon? What caused you to land at Iwo Jima? Uh, flak and uh, uh, engine problems. Remember, uh, we went into Iwo Jima in one instance, and we had one engine out. We had to actually circle there so many planes trying to land at that time. And what would you have done if you hadn't been able to land at Iwo Jima? We probably would have had to ditch and, uh, uh, the plane because we'd never have gotten back to uh, uh, the islands. Did that thought ever cross your mind? Well, it's interesting. You block out after the war. You blocked out all all those for, for years. You never know, thought. And then all at once, writing this uh, biography, a lot of these experiences tend to come back. Can you tell us about any of them? Well, it was uh, the incident about the fighter coming out of the uh, uh, clouds and the, uh, uh, the comradeship that you experienced with the uh, uh, the crew, the other members. And some of the incidents were we land with uh, holes in the plane from flak and, and so forth. Uh, after the uh, uh, bombs were dropped, we did the, uh, we were in Hawaii when the atom bombs were dropped on the way back. We landed there the day of the last 29 mission. We didn't take off on that, but we did do the fly over the Missouri. And we were one of the lead planes on that. And then uh, after that, uh, I was uh, assigned to uh, various uh, missions, uh, dropping the supplies to uh, prisoner of war camps. And that was one of the most uh, exhilarating experiences. You'd see these fellows waving their hands below and, as you drop supplies to them. And how did you how did you come back to the United States? Well, <clears throat> uh, after the uh, war was ended, you had to make a decision whether you're going to stay in or not, of course. And uh, our crew came back. We had uh, planes assigned to us, so we flew back intact uh, and landed. In fact, uh, well, we landed in the San Francisco area, and uh, some of us uh, uh, were uh, <coughs> decided to stay in too. Decided to stay in, and they were assigned uh, to other uh, uh, bases and. Uh, those of us who decided on the discharge, we went uh, home for furlough and came back for a discharge, and that was it. Okay, so what, what, uh, what did you do after the war? Uh, I uh, returned to the University of Michigan mm -hmm. and finished there, and then I went on to uh, New York uh, at Columbia University, and I got a master's degree in social work, and, uh, and then I started a four-year career in social work. The, uh, Social worker and as an administrator, worked in Johnson administration, Washington, uh, and uh, confidential assistant, assistant secretary, and then uh, director of the Family Service, San Francisco, and uh, director of the Family Service, Nassau County, uh, assistant secretary of elder affairs in Massachusetts, and then I was in uh, the Model City program in in the Boston area. And uh, did you marry children? Yes, I married my, in fact, my wife was a social worker also. And uh, we worked together as social workers. And we, uh, she passed away a number of years ago. I have a son in uh, Ithaca and his family and a daughter in Scarsdale and her family. And I had been living in the land area and decided I wanted to come up to have greater access to the family. So I'm living at the Hilltop Retirement Community, which is beautiful community in this area. 
Uh, how did you decide to come to uh, Binghamton? Well, I, uh, when I was in uh, Massachusetts, uh, I had about 90 nursing homes under me at the time. And uh, so I was well acquainted with the retirement and uh, nursing home community. And uh, Hilltop uh, has always had an excellent reputation. So I stopped by and made a visit and see, and it was halfway between my uh, youngsters, yeah, seemed to be a logical place to live. And I've been very happy during the couple of years I've been there. So what do you do to keep busy nowadays? I'm working on genealogy and uh, I've been trying to trace back uh, family members, which is fascinating. Uh, and then I've been working on this uh, uh, history of our crew. We have one that's, uh, I finished uh, part one, which is about 150 pages, then starting on the second, which is, uh, would be much more uh, uh, a look at the uh, B-29 components and so forth. Oh, um, let me ask you some questions, mm -hmm. uh, in no particular order, mm -hmm. but did you use the GI Bill to go to school? Yes, uh-huh. I was very fortunate. That's my way paid through. Uh, now, when you were when you were a young man, the first year at the University of Michigan before you went into mm -hmm. the, the Air, Air Corps, what did you think you wanted to be when you got out of college? I didn't know at that point. I uh, my parents were both uh, college educated and uh, were both teachers, and uh, I uh, I was thinking of going into. Uh, uh, the business community. In fact, I'd had a, a fellowship offered me from the Warren School of Business, and I'd also had one at Columbia University. So I took the Columbia University, flipped the coin, in fact, <laughs> and decided to go there. Why social work? Well, my parents uh, had been uh, in the uh, humanities and uh, as teachers and so forth. And uh, I uh, I had decided that I wanted to get into something where I'd, I'd be a productive, and I guess uh, citizens, I guess there was actually some guilt about all the uh, killings that we had to do with so on so on. So we decided maybe this is the time to make a contribution to humanity. So what you did in the war actually influenced? I think so, yeah. 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 So. Did any of the experience that you had in the war uh, contribute to your, to your ability to deal with people. Oh yes, I think the uh, uh, being in the military gave you uh, a sense of organization, how to organize the importance of organization, and uh, the uh, uh, working with different kinds of relationships and uh, defining your role, your responsibilities, and keeping to it. So I think that was extremely helpful as I moved into the administration and social work, running social agencies. What about any of the interpersonal uh, relations? Did anything from your wartime experience contribute to your ability to relate to people as individuals later on? Well, I suspect it did. I had maintained contact, as I indicated, with the uh, rest of the crew. But you had that very close layer, closeness, comradeship, and uh, all the values that come out of that, uh, maintaining that kind of uh, relationship over the years, and the importance of a, a relationship. Let's talk about that for a minute. Why was this comradeship different than, or how was this comradeship different than the comradeship you might experience from other, you know, fellow employees? And, uh, well, the there are a number of things, I suppose. One was the hierarchies that had to be observed and respected. And, uh, and understood, and to see that as a uh, positive, not a negative. And then, uh, secondly, the uh, interdependence that you had on each other, which was uh, uh, very important. And uh, you, got to, uh, you got to be a part of people's families, too. And, uh, as, you, uh, as people left the service married and so forth, the relationship to their children and your children was important. So you thought that this comradeship was different from other kinds of comradeship? You well, it's probably uh, much more explicit, much more definitive. That uh, you had to work together, and 
there had to be a way of doing it in the uh, in the services of course uh, you uh, you were under uh, kinds of regulations and so forth that you had to respect uh, each other and what each could contribute regardless of rank and so forth it's very interesting once you got on that plane rank disappeared uh, was, how did you feel about the guys on your crew they were like brothers very uh, it was very interesting that once you got off the plane, you had that segregation going on, you know, officers and enlisted men. But once you uh, uh, got onto the plane, uh, that tended to disappear. And you mentioned something about values. Were there any particular values that stuck out in the mind? Yeah, and uh, what was important uh, uh, to you at the time in, in service respect for others, discipline, and uh, timing, being on time. I mean, just the very basic rudiments of working together were really in force. And that carried over into my civilian life. Now, were they, were they enforced by the organization, or were they enforced informally among the, your fellows? Well, it was enforced in the sense that, uh, of their importance, and that whether you were uh, you operating within the structures of, a, of an office or a responsibility or uh, just that in leisure that uh, you, uh, you became accustomed to this kind of way of doing things and living and respecting uh, people about you. But did you become accustomed to it because somebody taught you that or was written as a rule? Or did you become accustomed to it because that's what you're colleagues expected of you? Probably all three. And uh, when uh, when you did that, you got a response. And uh, there was always a mutual support flowing through the crew. And the gunner uh, was often the unsung hero in the uh, uh, plane. I mean, they were all as, as important as, as anyone else. Were you concerned at all about uh how you stood in the eyes of your fellow crewmen or felt responsible for not letting them down? Well, I suppose there was uh, that, but it was more of, uh, there was a routine to be followed, and uh, if, and it had to be harmonious. If it wasn't harmonious, uh, you had a problem. And so as you stayed together, worked together, uh, the edges tend to be smoothed out then. Uh, people's roles were uh, uh, defined and uh, accepted. You didn't have any crewmen that you had a problem with that you couldn't resolve? No, I had a, well, one incident was uh, a, uh, a crew member, one of the gunners, had uh, uh, snapped at me or something of that sort, and uh, the captain uh, said, Rogers, get on that. And so I had to reprimand them. And that always stuck with me that uh, I had to do that, uh, it was, but it was necessary. And so uh, it's just one of those experiences you had. Why did it stick with you? Well, I didn't want to do it, I guess, in one instance. And secondly, it was the use of authority, which uh, was. Uh, uh, out of the ordinary, and it wasn't that important to me at the time, but it was very important to the uh, uh, captain of the crew. Well, that's an interesting point. Now, you're a young man. These enlisted crew mm -hmm. members are young men. They're mm -hmm. not much younger than you mm -hmm. are. Right. Maybe even some of them were older. They were, yeah. But you're suddenly the officer, and you're the authority. Yeah. How did they accept that? Why did they accept that? Well, they accepted it as, as, uh, as part of being in the service. Secondly, they accepted it as a responsibility. They had a responsibility to recognize uh, authorities, the various lines of authority. And uh, third, that uh, as these uh, pieces fitted together, you became a, uh, a smooth uh, operation, a comfortable operation. 
and uh, the more that you respected and understood uh, what your responsibilities were, uh, that uh, the easier life was for everyone. So was there something a dynamic going on here where where you had to accept your responsibilities, so therefore you expected them to accept theirs, and, and they accepted that you had certain responsibilities because they had others' responsibilities themselves? Yes, I think. Uh, and if one was out of line, that this showed up. I mean, Eleven men had to work together. They had various kinds of responsibilities and depth of responsibilities, so that uh, it would just take uh, one individual who might be out of sorts you know, to uh, send a wave through the group, which could not be. You know, what, what was the potential cost of one out of eleven being out of line? What you could, could just, wrong? pardon? What could go wrong if one out of eleven? I mean, ten guys were doing right, one guy's doing wrong. Well, ten it would disrupt the whole harmony of the, uh, uh, of the mission. If you're on the mission, it's very, was, very important. Was that just an inconvenience, or was that more than No, it was very serious. You, you might have a, uh, a gutter that wasn't, uh, uh, was distracted on something else. And that could be a uh, life uh, issue. And uh, so you had to understand what your responsibilities and limits of them and where somebody else. Uh, that came into your your life. Well, let's go back to your missions. Um, unlike uh, Europe, where they would start their day with a breakfast, you would start your day with a with a dinner because you were on night missions, right? Right. Yeah. Any special foods you ate or avoided eating? No. Uh, as I recall, uh, you, you just followed the normal course, whatever uh, the menu was. You. You and uh, you had it, and then you had your various kinds of, uh, of briefings, and, uh, and then you had to uh, do the checkouts on the line, the rather intensive checkout. And uh, once that was done, you're getting ready to to board the plane. Once you're on the plane, right. now you had flown three missions in the CB in the China Burma India theater. Yes. Uh huh. And then you flew ten combat missions from the Marianas. Right. Yeah. Do you remember where, the, where those missions were? Yeah. Uh, in the uh, India, down around the Singapore Burma area. Mm -hmm. When we got to Mariana Islands, it was on the mainland of, uh, of Japan. We were on uh, two Tokyo missions, uh, Nagoya, and uh, uh, Kobe and Osaka uh, missions. And then uh, we were fortunate in uh, coming back uh, to the States for that uh, uh, month training. Well, let's break here because we're, we're running a little. Tape two, interview of Mr. Richard Benson Rogers, 13 March 2001. Let's go back to your missions, Mr. Rogers. Um, the Tokyo missions, were those incendiary raids? Yes, they were. That, uh, If you recall, a, a decision had been made. Uh, uh, and I've gotten into this uh, through uh, various uh, historical uh, records, books, and so forth. Uh, the politics of what was going on at the time, which we were totally unaware of. But we did know that uh, certainly uh, our missions were much different uh, once we got over to Marianne Island. The decision had been made that, and the rationale was that the Japanese had uh, uh, their arms factories and so forth had been uh, desegregated into residential areas. And so uh, the, what you had to do is go in and, and clean out the areas in, in uh, residential areas. And an effort was made to uh, warn the people that certain t cities would be targeted in advance to get, hopefully, to give them time to get out of the cities. And I recall going in on, on Tokyo, we go in on 
one night and uh, uh, come back a couple nights later and you'd see the quadrant that you had burned out the previous uh, mission, still burning, smoking, and then you'd uh, level another area. And the inhumanity, humanity never touched you because you were so separated from all of that. What did it look like, I mean, at night, looking down? Just smoke, smoke, and uh, uh, searchlights, of course. I remember one incident, I said to uh, Carl Lady, uh, hey, Carl, there's a plane right above us. And he says, that's not another plane, it's our shadow on the cloud above us. And the searchlights from uh, uh, below. And of course, the uh, uh, gunners in back were uh, at the doors open and throwing out uh, uh, this metallic uh, fiber to distract the uh, um, the light from below. Mm -hmm. And you never felt any compunctions or moral concerns about? Well, you just. Uh, of course, all of that hit you later on, but your uh, job was just to do your duty, and, uh, and that was it. And you were quite isolated from that. That uh, it was, uh, and there was, all, of course, a rationale uh, 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 given for it, and so you just had to do it. Did you ever have feelings of they deserved it? Uh, Pearl no, Harbor? I don't. Uh, I've often wondered. Uh, about the uh, fighters we had to shoot down. They were doing their duties, we did ours, and who were they? You know, and these are the kinds of questions that came up after the war, not uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, you just couldn't afford to have those kinds of feelings. Did you come to any conclusions after the war about these thoughts? They were doing their job and we were doing ours. Mm -hmm. um, you had talked about the, the one uh, fighter that attacked mm -hmm. your ship on uh, a raid in uh, Burma. Uh -huh. uh, was it, well, there are instances where you had to engage Japanese fighters. Pardon? Did you have to fight off Japanese fighters? Yeah, it seemed, uh, as I recall, a lot of it you block out of parts. But as I recall, uh, uh, what we call the chow line, and that is lining up uh, to come in on, on you. And then from that point on, <laughs> it's difficult to remember really what took place. Have you ever uh, visited Japan since? No. Now, how did you feel about flying? I mean, you've gone through the civilian pilot program. And, I mean, was there a certain exhilaration to just being airborne? Oh yeah, I loved flying from the uh, from the start, and. Uh, it's uh, a few, th those days, of course, you didn't have the uh, uh, jet planes and the very sophisticated planes you have uh, flying around us uh, uh, these days. And this was a small town in Michigan, and we had a small airport, so that uh, uh, flying was uh, much more uh, simplified and, uh, as you fly around the state. And, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of it was uh, visual. Uh, in fact, I don't think we had, we didn't have radar on, uh, on the small planes at that point. Mm -hmm. It was all uh, visual activity. Now, your position on the B-29 was up forward in the plexiglass nose. Yeah, yeah that was interesting, uh, yeah, what you can become accustomed to. Uh, the uh, radar uh, radio operator was uh, three or four feet behind me. You had the pilots. Uh, on the right was your uh, co-pilot. On the left over your left over was the uh, pilot. And behind him was a uh, uh, the navigator. And then behind the big turret was the radio operator. And I remember going back, wandering back there, and uh, I'd get claustrophobic. But if the radio operator came up where I was, you'd almost faint because it was just like the open space. And, uh, but it's whatever you uh, get accustomed to. And I've gone into a B uh, up into a B-29 recently, and I'm amazed at how little space uh, was up front. Two pilots, 
bombardier with his uh, a gun sight and a bomb sight, and a spaceman navigator in this table, and the big turret and the radio operator. Well, what was it like? I mean, taking off and landing, uh, viewing that from the. Well, you became so accustomed to what your responsibilities were. I remember taking off uh, one time and. Uh, Carl uh, Lee, uh, Dick, uh, is it left or right? He said, we're taking off. To, uh, and uh, he said, uh, should we go left? And I yelled out, right. And for there's total confusion at that point. Did I mean to go right or he was right? <laughs> well, we got it straightened out. What would you say was the most dangerous or difficult part of the mission? Well, uh, being sure that uh, you were, uh, everything was operating correctly. Uh, you all had, you had different responsibilities. My responsibility was uh, as you came in on the uh, turning point, uh, we would fly so many hours uh, individually and then collectively. It depended whether you were going in as uh, uh, individually, what you did at night or as a part of a small group, but if you went in individually, you had to get to the turning point, which would be maybe 50 miles from your target, and as soon as the uh, pilot got adjusted uh, and pointed the plane in the right direction, the uh, bomb site took over, and then you, uh, you had, that was your responsibility from that point on. And uh, you had to be uh, uh, not distracted by any fighters coming in or any flying and that sort of uh, activity. So your responsibility was right to the point of dropping the bombs and uh, once they're away, uh, shifting it back to the uh, pilots. Did you feel differently about the fighters than you did about the flak? Not really. <laughs> uh, both were equally dangerous. It was, uh, of course, the uh, uh, flak was, uh, he didn't tend to humanize that, and, uh, as you uh, with the fighters up there. But the, uh, and of course, the uh, flak followed the searchlights down below, and so he tried to get out of the searchlights. And if all oh, once you get in a blast of searchlights, you were, you know, in danger. Was it very accurate or inaccurate? Difficult to tell. Uh, we'd come back with holes in the plane and so forth, and uh, it's very difficult to tell what uh, uh, the accuracy of the amount going on. And uh, life up there is it's almost as if you're on another planet uh, from the activity down below. Mm -hmm. And of course, they used to put the, uh, and you wouldn't really. Uh, know the impact of the uh, flak until you got down. Uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, flak and the uh, problem with the engines on the 29 were always a concern. I can still hear uh, on the way back from a mission, the uh, engineer would be sitting in his uh, seat and he had, uh, I think it was four gas tanks, and you would just click, 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 go from each gas tank to another to measure what was, to see how much gas was left in each one. Mm -hmm. And in my uh, nightmares at times, I used to be able to hear that click, 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 that uh, you'd be checking the, uh, uh, the gas tanks. Were these nightmares you had during the war or after the after war? After the war, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think the significance of the clicking was? Running out of gas? Yeah, he was constantly had to constantly check his each uh, gauge. If it was related to a gauge, he'd have to uh, check and then uh, uh, it was uh, just a uh, uh, part of the routine. And were you concerned about running out of gas or water? Oh, we were always concerned about that, yeah. We we're not going to have enough gas to, to make it back. And as I indicated, we had to land at Iwo Jima a couple of times because of both flak and uh, the gas issues. Were you concerned about what would happen if you had to ditch? Is that something? Well, there was always a routine. You were uh, uh, 
to what it would have, what you would do, and your responsibility in case of ditching. Mm -hmm. So it's all part of the training program. Were you ever concerned about what would happen if you had a bailout over Japan? It, well, not at that point, but there was, there was one incident, and uh, Carl uh, uh, recalled it in, in, in our memoirs that uh, a, a bomb got stuck in the bomb bay. And uh, I had to go back, tie myself in with a rope, lower myself down, and get rid of the bomb. And uh, it was on the way back, or on the way to a mission. And uh, we're 9,000 feet above the water at that point. And I remember debating as to whether I'd have to, uh, well, I had to leave my parachute. I had to take my parachute off. That was one of the, I had to make a decision about that. So I took the parachute off and just lowered myself down my rope. How'd you get the bomber? Well, it was, uh, I don't recall the details of it, but it was just hooked up and it was just a mechanical uh, sort of thing. You had to release a couple of pins. And well, that must have been quite a sensation. Um, the Bombay doors were open. You're tied to a rope 9,000 feet away. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah, 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 yeah. But you tend to do. Uh, uh, you know, tie that in with all the other experiences. Only after did you realize what was taking place. What could have happened if you just left the bomb there? Couldn't land it. Couldn't land. So you had to take this risk? Oh, yeah. Because otherwise, ten other guys might be in danger. That's right, yeah, yeah. So it was your duty, so it was your responsibility. So it was it. Are you thinking about that when you're hanging by a rope trying to kick a bomb out? Or? No, <laughs> you just wanted to get it out, period. And I guess that's what the military does in the sense that, you know, you, uh, you have a responsibility and, uh, and that's it. And you don't think about it until you get down on the ground. <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah. Now, you, had, you mentioned earlier that you'd like to get a copy of this tape for your grandson. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like him to know about that we haven't talked about? No, I think you've covered it very well. That uh, it's, uh, uh, I became a pacifist after the war. Uh, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and so forth. That, uh, uh, and I guess uh, I went in, one reason I went into social work. So I was uh, called back for the Korean War. But I remember uh, the board, uh, military board at uh, Selfridge Field, and uh, the, uh, I indicated what I wanted to do, and so they released me. Did you did you see a distinction between World War II and Korean Vietnam? Were they different wars, or were they just more wars? Or? Well, you really didn't uh, make that kind of distinction. It was, uh, again, you were being called on, and uh, you, uh, enough is enough in the sense, you know, that, uh, uh, but some of the fellows stay in and went on. And I didn't criticize them for that at all. It was just... Was World War II different in your mind than Korea or Vietnam? I say, I suspect it was, because at that point that, uh, uh, there were 16 million people joined into the armed services and uh, during World War II. Yeah. If the same, if you were young again and the world was faced with the same situations mm -hmm. that it was faced in 1939-1941, would you fight now or would you be a pacifist knowing what you know now? I really can't answer that question. I really can't. I think the, uh, I'm against killing of any form right now. So well, let's go back to uh, uh, the things that you'd like your grandson to know about. Mm -hmm. uh, some values, uh, some uh, uh, more than just your experiences. If you could boil it down into one kind of essence, this is what I learned and I'm going to hand on to you, what would it be? Well, you have a responsibility to other people, and that's probably the, the most important thing in life. That, uh, and if you expect uh, people to understand you, uh, you have to uh, 
it devotes the same kind of energy to understanding them. I think understanding and acceptance. Uh, and you can grow out of that. That's responsibility as a person. Anything you'd like to add? No, I think there's... Uh... He'd like to read that uh, paper. Would you like to read that? While we're on tape? All right. Uh, would you have enough? It's four minutes. Sure, absolutely. Uh, this is the introduction uh, for the Veterans Day service, November 12, uh, 2000. Dick Rogers saw combat in the United States Army Air Corps in the Pacific in World War II. Married, became a pacifist, a UNU member, and a social worker in the human, service, human services for over 40 years. Now living in the Hilltop Retirement Center, with a son and family in Ithaca, and a daughter and her family in Scarsdale, New York. Thank you. When I was first asked to say a few words as a member and veteran, several thoughts came to mind. It was during World War II, the 1940s, that many of us came of age. Millions worked in war plants on the home front or in the services fighting on foreign soil. There were equally gallant conscientious objectors and soldiers doing their duty as they saw it. During World War II, 16 million men and women, children of the Great Depression, were drawn into the armed services. 400,000 died, never to return home from the ground, sea, and air wars. Millions of others across the globe were casualties of this worldwide conflict. Over the past several years, I've been working on a biography of the experiences, missions, and comradeship of our World War II B-29 crew. After a dozen CBI and Pacific missions, we had returned to the States for advanced lead crew training for the final assault on the Japanese homeland, an experience I doubt we would have ever survived. We were on our return back to the Pacific when the war ended. Ronald Spector's book, Eagle Against the Sun, addresses this period from the perspective of the infantryman and the Marine. It could have well applied to our own Air Corps crew. When the atom bombs dropped and news began to circulate that Operation Olympic, the invasion of the Japanese homeland, would not take place, and we would not be obliged to storm up the beaches near Tokyo, assault firing while being mortared and shelled. For all the fake manliness of our facades, we cried with relief we were going to live. We were going to grow up to adulthood after all, a feeling we all shared together. Two experiences have always remained with me. After dropping our bombs on the Japanese dry dock off Singapore, I gave the bombs away signal as I began shedding my flak jacket and turning the controls of the plane back to the pilots. Out of the clouds came a Japanese fighter. I scrambled for my gun sight in the plexiglass nose. I shot it down as a bore in us with guns blazing away. I've often wondered who that pilot could have been also doing his duty. The other very vivid experience was at the end of the war, dropping of supplies to the waving Allied soldiers below, liberated from internment in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. For America, the war was an awakening that marshaled in the struggles and accomplishments that evolved into the complex and wondrous America we have today. Tom Hanks in his radio plea for funds for a World War II memorial, and Tom Brokaw in his The Greatest Generation book speak eloquently about the significance of this period. Tom Brokaw points out that America in its proudest moment was also forced by World War II to face its greatest shame, racial and gender inequality, a challenge that continues to this day. 
For the next several decades after World War II, opposition to the Korean and Vietnam War, the civil rights marches, the war in poverty became a passion and tone for many of us, including my wife Muriel and myself, in the involvement as adults and parents. If I recall these events, the powerful and melodious voices and messages of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. still resonates within me. As Dr. King noted, the Sunday morning hour was America's most segregated. It is a challenge that still stands. I am hoping our church will someday be a leader in the spiritual desegregation movement, a gift to the children of today and tomorrow. I have left with Reverend Herridge a draft of a program proposal beginning at the Sunday school level for the congregation's consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers, what is the abbreviation you, you stand for? Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church. That's the one that's just down the road? Yeah, Riverside Drive. Okay. okay. One last opportunity. Anything else you want to add? No, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, thank you.